Welcome to our 15 minutes of daily inspiration. I'm your pastor of internet and innovation, Kerr Vance Ross, and you are on the New Birth platform as I stand here in Atlanta, my home city, uh, in front of the National Black History Museum. It is more than apropos that we have the opportunity to not just do our inspiration as we normally do because of everything that's going on in our country, everything that's going on in our world. And as a people, African-Americans, we need inspiration more than ever. And we've decided not to just do our inspiration as usual, but today you'll be getting inspiration from the one and only Malcolm X, better known as El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. He's gonna give us some inspiration as only he can. If you would, share, tag a few people, get your children, get your family, get your friends, get ready to be inspired. Do it and do it now. Are you ready? Malcolm X. I've never at any time made any statement that anybody can even interpret uh, to indicate that I believe in uh, initiating acts of aggression or violence indiscriminately against people. The racialist never understands a peaceful language. The racialist never understands the nonviolent language. The racialist, we have, he's spoken his language to us for 400 years. We have been the victim of his brutality. We are the ones who face his dogs that tear the flesh from our limbs only because we want to enforce the Supreme Court decision. We are the ones who have our skulls crushed, not by the Ku Klux Klan, but by policemen, only because we want to enforce what they call the Supreme Court decision. We are the ones upon whom water hoses are turned with pressure so hard that it rips the clothes from our back. Not men, but the clothes from the backs of women and children. You've seen it yourself. Only because we want to enforce what they call the law. Anytime you live in a society supposedly based upon law, and it doesn't enforce its own law because the color of a man's skin happens to be wrong, then I say those people are justified to resort to any means necessary to bring about justice where the government can't give them justice. Since self-preservation is the first law of nature, we assert the Afro-Americans' right to self-defense. The Constitution of the United States of America clearly affirms the right of every American citizen to bear arms. And, as Americans, we will not give up a single right guaranteed under the Constitution. The history of unpunished violence against our people clearly indicates that we must be prepared to defend ourselves, or we will continue to be a defenseless people at the mercy of a ruthless and violent racist mob. If you're interested in freedom, you need some judo, you need some karate, you need all the things that will help you fight for freedom. The only time it's intelligent to be nonviolent is when you're dealing with someone else who's nonviolent. I'm nonviolent with those who are nonviolent with me. But we are not nonviolent with anyone who is violent with us. Once those intentions are made known, we can get to the nitty gritty of the problem. We can get to the core of the problem. We can get to the root of the problem. And then we can correct the problem. When humanity looks upon itself not as black men, white men, brown men, red men, and yellow men, but as human beings, then they will sit down and live together in peace. I'm not interested in violence. See, when whites approach the problem, they approach it to avoid violence. This is the wrong approach. This is the wrong objective. This is the wrong motive. If a problem is criminal, it should be approached to eliminate the criminal aspects of it. Violence having nothing to do with it, or the threat of violence having nothing to do with it. But when you help a man who's been criminally mistreated, just to keep him from exploding violently, it's the wrong motive. And this is what I'm trying to, what I have been trying to make the white uh, citizens see. So anything that we do is not to avoid violence. What we do is to correct a problem that has existed too long. Now, if it it takes more violence to correct it, we're not even uh, afraid of that. If it can be done peacefully, then we're hopeful of that. But violence, or the threat of violence, or the fear of violence, 
no way enters into our plan of operation at all. Whereas 20 years ago, when you'd have a little race riot, it was confined to a community. Today, Mike, if you have any kind of racial explosion, it will engulf the entire city, and it will have a chain reaction effect of spreading from city to city, and on an international scale from country to country. And I, for one, would not like to see it happen, but I am a realist enough, and I'm man enough, to face the fact that the uh, potential ingredients for this explosion exist, and I will never try and make the public think that it doesn't exist. You see, if you could get away from looking at it as violence, then you would be objective and see that actually, actually all it is is a tendency to react to what they are confronting. White people don't realize how frustrated Negroes have become. I think they have become to un that they have come to understand the Negroes' frustration, but they are also of a, the opinion that no good can possibly come from violence. If they are of that opinion, Mike, if you think that uh, the powder keg that's in your house is going to explode under certain conditions, Either you have to remove the powder keg or remove the conditions. You can't stand there and, and label the powder keg as, as an enemy when you have the ability or have it within your power to change the condition and it won't explode. It doesn't necessarily have to be an explosion if the proper type of education is, uh, in, uh, is brought about to give the people the correct understanding of the causes of these conditions that exist and to try and educate them away from this animosity and, and hostility. It would be more intelligent to prevent the explosion rather than to pick up the pieces after it happens. But again, you're dealing with a power structure that consists of primarily of politicians. And instead of trying to remove the causes of the explosion, uh, they deal with the conditions, so to speak. They and leave the causes there. Education is the is the first step toward solving any problem that exists anywhere on this earth which involves people who are oppressed. As a rule, the oppressed people lack education, and this has affected their ability to cope with their problem with themselves. And, and their inability to cope with their own problem places them at the mercy of someone else who's supposed to come up with a solution for their problem, but who can without a conflict of interest. It's only when the masses of people can approach their own problem that their problem will be solved. There's been a lot of talk because I was supposed to have said something about Negroes should buy rifles. White people have been buying rifles all their lives. <laughs> no commotion. America is based upon the right of people to organize for self-defense. The Second Amendment to the Constitution uh, spells out the right of people under this particular governmental system to have arms to defend themselves. And in areas uh, in this country where the government has proven itself either unwilling or unable to defend the black people, it is time for the black man to stand up and start defending himself. Not to go out and initiate acts of aggression against uh, whites or initiate acts of aggression against anyone, but in areas where we see that the government will not protect us or defend us or find those who have brutalized us and made us the victim for the past 400 years, then it is time for us to do whatever is necessary to defend ourselves. Professor Mark DeWolf Howell of the Harvard Law School, uh, speaking for 29 other law professors, pointed out that the United States government could intervene by law in uh, the state of Mississippi by sending troops. And since the Attorney General uh, and others in the federal government have pointed out uh, that they don't intend to send federal troops in themselves to protect the lives and the property of the Negroes who are being brutalized down there. It's our intention to try and organize the black people or the American Negroes in this country into self-defense units in that area, in areas where the government is unwilling or unable to defend our people, we will defend our people ourselves. Well, as long as it is an intelligently organized uh, effort that is being made, uh, the discipline involved will keep our people acting intelligently and discriminately. But if something isn't done in this country to organize Negroes who are fed up with this nonviolent, turn-the-other-cheek approach, 
uh, in a sensible direction to bring about the halting of this uh, brutality that we are constantly the victims of, then Negroes are going to react in a disorganized way, in an unintelligent way, and an indiscriminate way when it comes to retaliation. So we actually think that we're doing more to uphold the law and protect in protecting the lives and property of our people in an organized way than to sit around and let a disorganized uh, effort uh, develop. develop. Uh, in the face of the brutality that our people encounter, it's not unjust to teach a Negro to have a, a shotgun or a rifle in his house. What if it were illegal to have a shotgun or a rifle in a illegal? prison zone? Yeah, what if it were illegal? That's correct. Would you still advocate it? We never advocate. I would never advocate anything illegal. Even in an area where Negroes could be attacked? I would never advocate anything illegal. It should be emphasized that by this I don't mean that we should go out and look for trouble or start trouble or initiate acts of aggression. But we should feel that we are within our human rights, our civil rights, and within the rights of intelligence to do whatever is necessary when we are attacked to defend ourselves. In fact, the best thing to teach our people is never to be the aggressor, never to look for trouble. But anytime anyone makes any effort to brutalize us or to inflict wounds upon us, we should feel that we are within our right to do whatever is necessary to repel them. Do nothing unto anyone, but always to do whatever is necessary to keep others from doing to you, which they've been doing for the past 400 years. I think that if the government is concerned, instead of uh, being so worried about what the Negro is going to do, the government should stop dragging its feet and take the initiative necessary to eliminate the injustices that frustrate Negroes and drive them into a method of uh, a defense such as this. I was in Africa all, during all of the riots last summer, and many of the Africans asked me the question, why do they tear up their own neighborhood? And I pointed out that it isn't their own neighborhood. They don't own the homes that they live in. They own, the homes are owned by white landlords who live someplace else. They call them slum lords. The stores in the community are owned by white merchants who live someplace else. Usually, all of these absentee landlords and absentee merchants are the considered liberals, you know. They contribute to the NAACP and things of that sort, but they also play a major role in the community exploitation. And when the black community erupts, it looks upon this uh, uh, outsider as nothing but an exploiter. He doesn't own a house in the community to contribute good housing to the community. He doesn't own the store in the black community to contribute a, a higher uh, quality merchandise at a cheaper price. Almost the entire existence of these outsiders is wrapped up in the image of exploitation. So, and the policeman in the black community is not looked upon by the black citizen as someone who's there to protect their interests because he, they look upon him as someone who's in the black community to protect the stores of the white merchant or to protect the houses of the white landlord. And he looks upon, he's looked upon almost as an enemy army, proof of which he's the one in uniform who's used against the people of the community uh, when they're trying to seek redress to, to just grievances or when they're trying to enforce rights which the courts have said that they have. So that uh, the pattern in the past has been not to strike back at the policeman who crushes their skull with his club or who, whose dog tears the flesh from their limbs. They haven't struck back at him. But their tendency has been to strike at the property of the outsider that's in the neighborhood. And then the power structure interprets that as thievery and vandalism and things of that sort because they haven't yet analyzed the motive of the man who's involved in that. And their refusal to analyze it makes them miss the boat. They beat him. While he, was, while he was laying on the ground with a bullet through his heart, they put a hole in his head with their club. They were, it, they'd arrived early. As I told you earlier, even the policeman said, why should the ambulance hurry? There's nothing but niggers out there. Why, if some of you heard, if some of you could hear or were aware of the conversation that uh, the police engaged in concerning this event, I don't care how much anti-Muslim you might be, your own humane quality would make you resent with shame and uh, the door disgraceful behavior. Almost every statement that Commissioner Murphy makes uh, would give you the impression that he's encouraging the police, rank and file policemen, 
that uh, to take whatever method or measure is necessary to hold the Negroes in check. Uh, he feeds the type of statistics to the white public to make them think that Harlem is a complete criminal area that everyone is prone toward violence. This gives the police the uh, impression that they can then go and brutalize the Negroes or suppress the Negroes or even frighten the Negroes. Whenever something happens, 20 police cars converge on one area. This doesn't frighten Negroes. So it means that someone is either misinforming Commissioner Murphy and making him use tactics this year that he would not use four years ago or that the former police Kennedy would not use. And, and this uh, force that is so visible in the Harlem community creates a spirit of resentment in every Negro. They think they're living in a police state and they become hostile toward the policeman. They think that the policeman is there to be against them rather than to protect them. And these thoughts, these frustrations, these uh, apprehensions automatically are sufficient to make this, uh, make these Negroes begin to form means and ways to protect themselves in case the police themselves get too far out of line. What he's doing is creating a situation that can lead to nothing but bloodshed. And I'm not against the law. I'm not against law enforcement. You need laws to survive, and you need law enforcement officers to have an intelligent, peaceful uh, society. But we who have, have to live in these uh, places and suffer the type of conditions that exist from officers who lack understanding and lack any human feeling or lack any feeling for the fellow human being, we who have to suffer these things are beginning to see where we are not being considered at all when they select the type of persons that they send into Harlem to uh, enforce the law. I hope that you don't misunderstand me when I say that, and I'm not advocating anything illegal against the police. I know good police, and I know bad police. I know policemen that bend over backwards to be human and to protect other humans and to treat people as if they are human beings. Then I know others who shouldn't be on the force. They're not qualified morally, either even mentally. Some of them not even psychologically to be on the force. Well, those kind I don't go for. But those who can pass the test, they're all right. <laughs>